Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, do you know what you're eating? Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahialani Richardson. As an island state, Hawaii relies heavily on imported foods, but local vores and slow food advocates want to make sure we have more local options, everywhere from farmers markets to fine restaurants. How do we know which foods are not only best for our bodies, but also best for the sustainability of our islands? What should we be doing here at home to help increase the availability of fresh Hawaii-grown edibles? And what what can we do to make sure our food is safe, whether it's fresh from a garden or straight out of a kitchen? Tonight on Insights, do you know what you're eating? We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Now to our guests. Peter Oshiro is the Environmental Health Program Manager for the Department of Health. Peter is helping launch Hawaii's new restaurant rating system, which will help diners decide where it's safe to eat. Kaleo Ten is a community organizer for Kanu Hawaii. Kaleo's role includes leading Kanu's Grow Local campaign. For 2014, Kanu is challenging people around the state to eat local for the entire year. Kasha Ho is Hawaii's community and outreach coordinator at the Center for Food Safety. Working with a variety of Hawaii organizations, Kasha helps put fresh local produce into the hands of low-income and elderly residents. And Daniel Anthony is a poi pounder for Manaai, a family-run business that offers hand-pounded poi and paiai. Daniel doesn't just make and sell poi, however. He also teaches community members to pound taro themselves. And welcome to our guest and what a great topic, food, huh? Yeah. Kasha, why don't I start off with you? What sure. is the Center for Food Safety? Um, the Center for Food Safety is actually a national nonprofit advocacy group, and we work on issues of public health, so human health and environmental health, and we're especially focused on um, looking at destructive agricultural technologies, including genetic modification and overuse of pesticides. So that's what we've been involved with here in Hawaii for the past 10 years, and we're actually just about to launch our local office. So I'm one of two of uh, our first local Hawaii staff. And Kaleo, Kanu kind of has some similar philosophies as the Center for Food Safety, but how do you differ and where do you stand on things like organic foods and local foods? Well, local right now is kind of the focus to get people to grow their own food and eat locally grown food. I like to think that it's about local first and organic when necessary. That's right. And so when you're in the store, and there's so many choices these days, and now you, you feel that it's actually better to eat local as opposed to organic? I wouldn't say it's better to eat local than organic. Organic is always going to be um, for typically a healthier choice, but for the economy, for the, for the community, eating local is going to be my option versus an imported organic. And Daniel, why don't you talk about your quest to spread awareness about poi and pa'iai? And, and before you do that, what is pa'iai? Pa'iai is a precursor to poi. The traditional recipe for poi, in which pa'iai is a product, is a recipe that doesn't require any refrigeration for food preservation. So it can last for weeks, months, or even years unrefrigerated. Now what's interesting about that is there was an issue with you actually being able to sell it uh, in the retail markets, right? So how, how have we gotten over that and, and what was the issue with the Department of Health? You know, it. We both had the same intentions. It's about community health and well-being. We had two different perspectives that we were coming from. And so we were able, my personal self and our family, were able to learn a tremendous amount about food safety, not just the regulations, but how important it is in any type of eating, whether it's an establishment or your home. And so we came to an understanding that we both had the same mission and we just were using different terminologies. And so together we were able to come up with a solution that allowed for both of our values to, to remain. Their value of the community, you know, recognizing that, guess what, fresh hand pounded taro is, does not come out of a certified kitchen and that you do need to have some risks, which means being a consumer, paying attention. And for us, it was the freedom to be able to share our artisan craft in such a way that didn't oppose, impose upon our culture. And so, you know, we've been making it like this for thousands of years. We have no shame in telling people it's not made in a certified kitchen. Mm -hmm. But yes, eat at your risk. Peter, what do you make of that? 
No, it was great working with Daniel. Um, he educated me so much in the ancient cultural practices. And a lot of it does make sense. You'd think it would be counterintuitive, what he just said about leaving poi out forever, and it's not going bad. But it does have a very definite scientific basis. Poi is a starch that, as it gets older, the acidity level rises, which actually prevents bacterial growth. So once the pH falls below a certain level, the product is essentially non-potentially hazardous and shelf stable. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting talking with Daniel about um, the ancient practices and what they did. And you know, a lot of it did make sense to us. So we didn't advocate for the rule. Danny, um, Daniel advocated the legislature to change the law, um, which would compel the department to make rules to allow for the sale of PI, hand-pounded poi directly to the consumers. And we were very successful working with Daniel. And I think we've set up some kind of guidelines and rules where we're also protecting public health. So Daniel, and Daniel is one of the most educated or in his industry, he's gone over and above what the regular industry is required as far as education, where mm -hmm. he is food safety certified. He did take it very seriously, what we we're telling him about personal hygiene, how to introduce bacteria into foods and how to prevent that. So we were very happy with how he's turned out and his business and the way he's operating right now. Now the Department of Health is, is on the verge of a new restaurant rating system yes. and you brought your placards right, right there. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, the big impetus for the rules is threefold. We're going to actually increase fees on the industry to pay for all our program enhancements and staffing that we desperately needed. Um, the second thing was to adopt a nationwide standard for rules, which is the most current scientific thought. And the third thing was this placarding system or restaurant grading system. Yeah. So starting off with um, this past placard, um, during our routine inspections, um, if you have one major violation or less, um, the inspector will give you a past placard. And what major violations are, are violations that are directly related to foodborne illnesses. So these are not things like dirty floors, walls, and ceilings. These are things like um, attention to personal hygiene, making sure foods are at the proper temperatures, whether you're cooling things enough, um, and whether you're sanitizing your dishes, your dishwashing practices are proper. Mm -hmm. So again, one major violation or less, if it can be corrected prior to the inspector leaving the establishment, he'll issue a pass placard, yes. And this will be hung in the most visible place possible, so probably within five feet of the entrance um, where everyone can see it, yes. And you've got your yellow and your red placards. Obviously, red yes. is, a, is a major <laughs> violation. What about yellow? Yeah, what the yellow packet is is actually, this is a conditional pass. So if during the routine inspection, the restaurant gets two major violations or more, even if they can be corrected on the spot, two major violations to us indicates that the firm is going slightly out of kilter, so they do need a reinspection. So this conditional pass placard will be placed um, up, and it's a public notification, and there's six categories that we basically look at. Um, food protection, um, employee hygiene and personal health, um, protection from contamination, food temperatures, um, facility and equipment sanitation, insect rodent control, and unapproved food sources. Yeah. So these are the six things and various um, permutations in the establishment that are directly related to food um, borne illnesses. So. And Kasha, when you look at restaurants, a lot of them are touting, you know, we have local produce in our menu items. And is it any healthier, you think, that, that, that they're focusing on local foods now? Well, I think that um, local foods have health impacts, not only for the individual, but also for the community. So I think we can definitely say that local food doesn't travel as far, right? Because we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So if 85% of our food is imported, it's traveling at least 3,000 miles to get here. And we know that those foods will need to be not picked at the peak of ripeness because they won't make that trip over here, for instance. So we know that local food is fresher, it tastes better, it may be healthier for us, but I think it's also, as we've talked about, healthier for the community. You start to be able to build those relationships with your local farming families so you know exactly where mm -hmm. your food came from and what kinds of practices were used um, during its growing cycle and harvesting and how it got to your plate. So I think that it's really looking at health at a, in a more holistic way of kind of how does it affect our communities, how does it affect our ecosystem. Kaleo, you're trying to educate people about growing their own foods, but how realistic is it, especially people who live in small one-bedroom condos and they just don't have the space to grow food? Yeah, I live in an apartment building myself and I'm, I'm growing food in pots. So, I mean, it's as easy as getting um, a tomato and squeezing it into, you know, some dirt and, you know, leave it there. It's probably going to grow. So, I mean, if you start somewhere, you're doing something. 
What about you, Daniel? Do you actually grow taro in your backyard, or, or where do you find the taro to make your poi and pa'iai? Um, we source taro from a variety of uh, farmers from different islands. We are farming on Oahu. One of our philosophies is that if you're not farming taro, you're not really in the taro game or the taro business. And so what we've been searching for for the last seven years on Oahu are prime lands to farm taro in a serious manner. So we're in the back of Kahalu'u where we're storing uh, some ancient terraces, but due to where the water system is at, we actually don't run an Hawaii system, we rely on rainfall. And you call taro a superfood, why is that? You know, um, if you were allergic to your mother's breast milk, if you had a severe allergy to wheat, uh, gluten, this is a food that is a source of life. It has the smallest starch granule, so it makes for easy digestion. The beneficial bacteria that are cultivated when you have a traditional poi eating regimen, which is really having a bowl of poi on your table that you keep the pH at a certain level. And that's sour, but it's safe and very flavorful. And so in that consistency for people that have cancer that are going through chemotherapy, not only are they able to be sustained from it, but those beneficial bacteria help to regenerate the bacteria in their gut system. So we're finding that, you know, food is medicine, and when your medicinal food is the staple of your family, it's, it really has the effects just keep going outward. Now the Department of Health has more uh, restaurant inspectors now, Peter, yes. and so what are they finding out there? I mean, is it, sometimes you read those reports mm -hmm. and uh, they might be pretty gross. Well, again, I, when I first started as a program manager a few years ago, I had nine people in the field that were in charge of over 6,000 establishments here on Oahu. So what that meant was inspections every two years to two and a half years. So we cannot um, expect consistent compliance with food safety regulations if you're in a facility once every two years. The FDA recommends that we need a staffing level where we inspect the most high-risk establishments at least three times a year, um, the medium risk twice a year, and the smaller of facilities once a year. So in order to do that, we had to increase our staffing levels, and mm -hmm. we paid through that through our restaurant permit fees, and we're now at 25 people in the field, and we will hire five more people this year. So we'll have a total of 30 people um, in charge of 6,000 establishments, so that's very much in line with um, they'll be able to keep up with that restaurant. What kind frequency. of violations have you seen? Well, in again, years? the most typical for any food safety program throughout the United States, the number one thing everybody sees is personal hygiene. So this is not washing hands frequently enough, and especially wash, not washing hands when you're moving between raw and um, cooked food. So those, that's a real big hazard that's common to everyone. And also temperature controls, refrigerators that are not properly at um, cold enough and hot holding not hot enough. So those are very common things. Kasha, uh, Kalia from Waikiki has this question and uh, she thinks farmers markets are great, but how can we as consumers of produce from farmers markets know what kinds of pesticides or fungicides are being used on the produce that we buy? Yeah. I mean, there's usually no labeling, it's just all the produce is there. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the really wonderful things about having a face-to-face -face relationship with where your food comes from. You can actually talk to, and I encourage people, I, I work at some of the farmers markets, and I encourage people, if you have questions about how the food is grown, go ahead and talk to the farmers about it. They're very forthcoming to tell you um, what kinds of sprays they use and on what crops and um, and so that that information is available and it also gives you an opportunity to build that relationship and so it's kind of like a community building activity mm -hmm. as well. Kaleo for our food that's at the farmers market do they all of the produce do you think it always comes from a farm a small local farm or, or do you think sometimes uh, you know like the big producers somehow get in there? Well I don't know for sure I wouldn't want to talk about too many people I mean, you can look at some of the boxes that are, you know, stacked up with the food there. But like Kasha said, you know, talk to the farmer and talk to the people selling it and find out what's going on. Um, and it also depends on which farmer's market you're going to. Some are more known for the people in the area growing their food and bringing it to that market. Daniel, how have you seen poi grow commercially, not only culturally, but commercially? I mean, there's so many poi products out there. I think we're going to continue to see this uh, as a trend because we need to find a starch that's suitable to grow in Hawaii. And taro is a proven starch, it's a super starch that was established well over 20,000 acres. 
So if we want to, you know, live in 2014, we're going to have to eat a Pa'i pizza or some crackers or, you know, I mean, the reality is the world is where we draw ingredients and inspiration from. And so if we can look at our ingredients and see how they fit into the world, then I think we're going to find that more people want to eat here. So you've created recipes from Pa'i that look like just everyday things that we might see at a restaurant, like a pizza, pasta, and that sort of thing? Pizza, pasta, Cinnabons, we even do a vegan sashimi. I mean, it's amazing in the- Does it taste any good? I sh shared it with uh, Hawaii Tourism Japan and the ladies were speechless. So we aged it. And the mold around it, when you cut it and plated it, made it look seared. Mm -hmm. And when it sours, it turns pink. Mm -hmm. So it actually looked like sashimi wow. put on a platter with diced cabbage, right? Sliced cabbage and wasabi. You sort of pick it up and dip it. And the <laughs> crunch of the cabbage and the flavor of the wasabi just... You know, Daniel, you're going to make our viewers hungry as they're listening to this. <laughs> Kaleo, you know, you have a goal of, of having people eat local for an entire year. Is that realistic? Well, the goal is 10% increase in local food consumption for the year. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, I think it's realistic, you know, um, going to the farmer's markets and going out there and just kind of opening up your, your palate is going to be kind of part, you know, part of the, the solution. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's eating paella right now, but go out there and try it, you know, and, and growing some things at home is definitely going to help, whether it's getting your green onions, cutting it off and putting it inside there and eating that, so I think so. Kasha, do you think that we have enough land to totally support local food consumption? You know, that's a really good question, and I think that it's one that um, a lot of folks are trying to answer here in Hawaii. What we do know is that um, we won't have enough land unless we really prioritize it for um, food use and for agricultural use. And as Daniel was saying earlier, it's really challenging for local farmers to find accessible and affordable land um, here in Hawaii. And I think that one of the issues is that um, some of our largest agricultural sectors are being used not to produce food for local consumption, but are being used to produce genetically modified seeds for export to the mainland and to other places around the world. Mm -hmm. So some of our prime agricultural lands are not being used for food production. And I think that some of those issues really need to come to light in order for us to answer that question of can we feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, uh, Thomas from Waikele has a really interesting question about okay. food trucks because okay. they're really popular right now. Yeah. And he wants to know, will the health department rating system be applied to food trucks? Yes, they will. They'll be applied to anyone that currently has a permit with us. So the 6,000 permits we have on Oahu, 10,000 statewide, has everything from convenience stores, five-star restaurants, lunch wagons, um, institutional kitchens, schools. So anybody that sells food in any shape or form has a, that has a permit with us will be a, a part of this grading system. Yeah. What are you finding right now in terms of food trucks? Uh, you know, these are usually small owners, mm -hmm. they're mobile, uh, they, they're not really large operations. Mm -hmm. Do they have more violations than your typical restaurant? No, typically not. They're pretty much the same as any other food, um, food establishment that serves the similar type of menu. So there's nothing more to fear or um, be wary of if it is a truck. And the main thing is to ask, like anything else, to talk to them, ask if they have permits from the health department, and ask to see them, make sure that they have them on board. Mm -hmm. So they are required to have the permits with them and the permit numbers on the side of the trucks also. Kasha, uh, the Center for Food Safety has a, an interesting perspective on genetically modified foods, obviously very controversial on both sides of the issue, and, and where do you folks stand on that? Well, what we're really focusing on right now is um, our right to know. As consumers and as community members in Hawaii, we're really trying to support the efforts of local community groups and individuals who want to know, A, as a consumer, is the food that I'm eating genetically modified? So that comes to the issue of labeling, since we don't have labeling right now at a federal level. It's been something that's been coming up at a state level here in Hawaii and actually half of the states, 26 states in, in the United States last year, um, introduced legislation that really was looking at labeling genetically modified organisms. So as a consumer, that's one issue. And then also just as a community member, um, for these 
field trials that are happening um, in agricultural lands near our homes and near our schools. What is it that they're growing there and how much and what kinds of pesticides are they using? So those are some of the issues that have been coming up here locally that we've been focusing on. And Daniel, you were actually part of this movement and, and you were attending rallies against GMOs at one point, but now you've backed off. Why is that? You know, really, it's, it's focusing on solutions and it's also seeing that the movement here has grown and really solidified. We don't need every single voice to, to shout at the same problems. We need to each individually look at what are those solutions. For me, I believe that I have a clear vision that taro is a solution, that taro water takes water from future GMO use, from future agriculture industries that are going to be using heavy chemicals and pesticides. We're going to promote a type of agriculture that is important for our future, one that doesn't require inputs from outside of Hawaii, when all of our inputs are made locally. I mean, we need to talk about the future. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really happy that um, Kasha has, has, your office has come here because we need a, a much clearer picture. Hawaii, for this GMO issue, is such a focal point worldwide. And, you know, if everyone in the world that, that wanted to fight GMO sent us one dollar, we would win this year. And that's all it comes down to is money. Mm -hmm. And so instead of fighting against money, which I'm more than happy to do, but I had to put my sword down and pick up my o'o because planting taro is what's going to sustain those that are fighting. Mm -hmm. And so we are feeding them and our commitment is to plant taro while they're battling this because those people that are fighting for us they need food and they need support. Well, let's talk about money because uh, Kaleo, you know, a lot of people, they want to eat local, they want to eat organic, but it's just really expensive. You go to a health food store and you're going to pay a big paycheck for, for good, healthy food and it's a lot cheaper to eat stuff that's processed and not. So how do you, how do you help people eat healthy foods when it's more expensive? Yeah, that, that's a question about health in general too. Um, I mean, how much do we pay for health care? And maybe the food that we eat can correlate to, you know, the price of your health care. So if you eat healthier food, maybe you'd be healthier. And, and I'm, I'm also not so sure that all food really needs to be, you know, cheap. You know, maybe you pay more with your pocketbook or maybe you pay more with your labor and you go out there, work in a community garden or you go and volunteer somewhere, you know, meet with one of your neighbors and they might have a, experience growing food and help them out and so yeah I'm not so sure that you know it really needs to be cheap you know I mean, mm -hmm. let's keep a healthy healthy diet going. Peter there's a lot of questions about the restaurant rating system mm -hmm. because people are still trying to find out about it and one person wanted to know will food lander, handlers in supermarket delis be inspected and rated under the new rating system? Yes they are and again it's that's going to depend on the supermarket itself or um, it's going to be their choice whether to segregate out each of their departments or to have the whole facility under one permit. So we're going to leave that up to industry how they want to do that. So um, we've had indications from the larger markets that that's what they're willing to do, pull out a separate permit for their bakery, separate permit for the deli, separate permit for the seafood section, and one permit for everything else on the floor. So yes, they, but whether they do that or not, the deli handlers are all part of the inspection and, program. And if you find something, you're going to put one of those placards on exactly, there. Exactly, right. So if the store is worried about maybe the seafood section causing problems with the rest of the store. If it's all under one permit, then just that one section could, um, I guess, result in a conditional pass on the facility. Mm -hmm. If they have it all segregated out, then maybe only that seafood section will have a conditional pass and the rest of the store who have past placards, yeah. So it's up to them how they want to You know what's really it. interesting is that it seems as mm -hmm. though the industry is supportive of this right. because you would mm -hmm. think that they would say there would be a negative economic mm -hmm. uh, impact right. if there's a yellow or a red, but your, your experience was they actually supported it. Yeah, when we went through the public hearings, it was very surprising. We had very little blowback from industry, but the one concern that industry did have, honestly, was the conditional past placard and how long the Department of Health would leave that up. So we committed to industry that once they tell us they fixed all the violations, we would return within one business day to do a reinspection to follow up. And if everything has been corrected, we'll take down this um, yellow placard and put up the green pass placard. Uh, Kasho, how do you think people can really choose healthy foods when they're eating out? When they're eating out? Because well, there's so much tempting stuff out there. <laughs> there is. And I think that um, 
You know, one thing that you can do, as we've been talking about, is eat locally grown. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a great option and often results in a healthier meal. Um, I think that one thing to consider too is um, not just the health of our bodies, but also think about, you know, um, who are the workers that brought the food to you and what kind of conditions were they working under. So that's something that I try to keep in mind when I go out to eat. And as we've been talking about, I, I try to know as much as I can about the restaurant. Is it a locally owned business? Um, do I know the family that owns that restaurant or that mm -hmm. food truck? You know, so it's an opportunity to build relationships while eating out as well. And Daniel, talk about the price of Pa'i because there's a pretty big significant price difference between what you're producing and just the you know the the bag of poi in the supermarket in our movement there was a lot of lessons that were learned and what we realized is that if we wanted to see a healthy taro industry that we had to pay it forward we had to start paying for the kind of quality of taro that we wanted and needed and over the last few years the farmers have actually really risen up to that and so when you purchase taro at three to four times the commercial farm gate price, that increases your costs. When you hand pound it, the labor increases your costs. Here's what most people don't realize. If you use the Department of Health standards for poi, one pound of pa'i being 99% taro will make three to five pounds of ready to eat poi. So ready to eat poi is classified as poi containing no less than 15% solids, right? 85% water. And so that's three to five pounds of Hanalei or Taro brand refrigerated poi for one pound of pa'i. Now, if you were gonna go to regular poi, which is 27%, I believe, mm -hmm. um, that would, pa'i would make about two to three pounds of that. And so if you just take a look at the price of pa'i and you sort of factor it in that formula, it's actually very reasonable, which makes you consider how could the commercial industry buy it at four times less than us, have a huge machine that does it, yet when you actually measure apples to apples, we're, we're pretty much in mm -hmm. there. Uh, this couple questions for Peter Oshiro. With 6,000 restaurants and 30 inspectors, how many visits does this break down in a year for the individual restaurant or food truck? Right, the target for that staffing level was to have the high-risk facilities um, inspected three times a year. So many food trucks will fall into that category. Um, fast food outlets typically will be inspected twice a year. And then your smaller single um, item outlets like the cookie places or the ice cream shops will be inspected annually. So we do have the staffing level to um, inspect at that proper frequency. Yeah. You know, there was a big uproar over right. those rats in Chinatown mm, a while back. Right. Uh, how are things now? And uh, is it safe to eat food from Chinatown? Oh, it's absolutely safe to eat food in Chinatown. I'm not gonna say that the rats have problem has disappeared, but what happened is the food handling practices of the merchants has changed quite a bit. So the idea is if you cannot get rid of the rats in the community, then you have to protect your food supply. So each of the markets and facilities now realize that when they close up shop at the end of the day, everything has to be in rodent-proof containers, so nothing left out in the open. So that's mm -hmm. the key to protect public health. When they open up in the mornings, they make sure they wash, sanitize, wipe down all the surfaces that were exposed, and that's how they're going to keep the people safe. But we do have very few foodborne illness incidents and outbreaks coming out of Chinatown, so it is safe to eat there. Kaleo, talk about food security and why Kanu Hawaii decided to make that a priority. Well, Kanu Hawaii works towards the sustainability of Hawaii in general. Um, food is one aspect, um, then there's energy and waste. And uh, what the Grow Local campaign is about is getting people to grow their own food. And that is a, a cheaper way for people to do that versus going out to a restaurant or trying to find you know, food in a, or like a natural food store. A lot of those things are more expensive. So when it comes to sustainability and that as a whole, it kind of, it kind of starts with, with food. How, if Hawaii was cut off from the rest of the world, how long will we have with our current food supply? Well, I think there was, um, it was like, SB 937 or something it was like a bill that went out there and in that it talked about 10 days as um, what it would be like 10 days of food on shelves and after that I'm not so sure but I think people in Hawaii are kind of resilient in general definitely um, on other islands like Molokai and Big Island you know where they're growing a lot and people are fishing so and even on the um, on the fish industry in Hawaii I mean there's a lot out there we we collect like the most fish that you know goes out to the rest of America. So, um, 
But the rest of the stuff, you know, rice is imported, beef is imported, and that's probably not going to be around. Mm -hmm. Peter, is this an issue that your department actually looks at, you know, in terms of food mm -hmm. security? No, actually that is not part of our mission. Yeah, our mission is food safety. So the food security side, I guess, belongs with um, the administration. Yeah, so they need to look at those issues. And what about you, Kasha? Where, where do you stand in terms of, you know, food security and making sure that we can sustain ourselves? Yeah, well, I think that food security is a really important issue for Hawaii. Like we've been talking about, we're really isolated. We're the most isolated landmass in the world. Mm -hmm. And we're so dependent on outside imports that if anything were to happen, you know, a natural disaster, a labor strike, and we were cut off from those imports, we would be in really dire straits <laughs> pretty quickly. So I think that um, as consumers, it's a really important issue to look at. And, you know, I participated in Kanu's Eat Local um, challenge for quite a few years, and it really, I encourage everyone to try it. I tried to eat ex exclusively local for uh, an entire month, and it was hard. That means no rice? <laughs> no rice. No pasta, no, right? Yeah, my only starches were taro and um, breadfruit. And it was really challenging, but it brought home to me personally how dependent we are on outside imports and how many foods we wouldn't be able to eat here locally. Um, currently and in our current situation. So I think that it's really um, important for us to look at that and we have an important role as consumers to focus on locally grown and, and we can really use our consumer power and our consumer dollars to have that focus on local and sustainable and start to build up those industries. Well, tonight on Insights, we're asking, do you know what you're eating? We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Call 973-1000 on Oahu and 1-800-283-4847 from the neighbor islands. Let's go back to Peter Oshiro from the Department of Health. And uh, Sandra from Waikiki wants to know, is there any way to ensure that produce is, is really locally grown in the farmer's market? And how can you ensure that it's safe? And again, that's also more in the field of Department of Agriculture, where they promote local produce. So again, we, it's very hard to regulate that kind of thing. So I think a lot of it is voluntary, and it's just urging people to properly label their products, especially country of origin, that kind of thing. So you know, we don't really get into the economics of um, who can sell what products and what they call it, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Daniel, were you surprised that the Department of Health started working with you in, in trying to help you? sell your PAEI out in the markets? You know, the reality was that the, the Department of Health was responding to the community. And the community became aware that there was this rich food product that we had been missing for almost 100 years. And, you know, really individuals, you know, I, I did my part, but it was all the aunties and all the uncles and all the kupunas that said, oh, I remember that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was, it was putting those things together that really brought together the community Kalo, haloa, poi is very sticky. It brings things together. The way we act when we eat poi were all things that were important to the health department and to us. And so it was frightening when the health department initially came and said that we needed to stop. And we actually changed our practices and focused on education. But in the course, really realized that it, was a, it wasn't really an issue, but it was something that we needed to move forward on and the Department of Health's willingness. I mean, they literally said, look, Daniel, we're gonna change the rules regardless of if you guys do the legislation, you know? And we felt, though, that getting the community to that point to, for everyone to buy in and support it, that we wanted to finish. So we actually did the legislation, but the Department of Health was very clear to mm -hmm. us that it was kind of overkill. Mm -hmm. So we were very thankful, yes. Kaleo, how uh, realistic is it to completely cut off our dependence on imported foods? Well, people's you know, diet and palate has changed over, over the years, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate for that. I think people want to eat different foods, and I think that's fine. So, um, you know, increasing it by 10%, the local food consumption by 10% is more the key. And um, that's going to create a lot more jobs, and it's going to keep a lot of money circulating in the state. So I think that's a, a more 
realistic thing to mm -hmm. be thinking about. Kasha, some of the populations that you've been working with are, are low income and mm -hmm. elderly residents. Why are those populations more at risk to not eating healthy food? Mm, that's a good question and I should just clarify that that work is actually through another project that I'm doing um, that's mm -hmm. called Green Wheel Food Hub. So we've been working directly with low income communities and often folks who have different challenges to getting out and buying locally grown food. So that might be mobility challenges. We're working with uh, uh, affordable housing Kupuna Center out in Eva Beach and so we actually buy local produce from local farmers and bring it directly into the Kupuna housing facility there and then the elderly can come right down from their rooms and purchase um, the locally grown food and we provide the um, EBT the program formerly known as food stamps so we provide EBT access folks can swipe their cards and buy locally grown produce right there in their facility which is really nice because it's hard for folks to get out to farmers markets sometimes and there's there's very few opportunities here in Hawaii right now that exist to use your EBT dollars to buy locally grown produce. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're really focusing on. Daniel, here's an interesting question, and I know that Kahlo is your, is your focus, but uh, someone wants to know about breadfruit. And where do you see that industry, if, if at all, where do you see that going in the future? If you look at the ahupua'a, it was segregated into different food sources so that you could eat well, have a great lifestyle all year long. So ulu is a part of that component. It's something that takes more time, it's a longer investment than taro. It's something that is equally as rewarding. The one thing I love about ulu is you plant it once and it showers food. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I think ulu is very important. Um, some of the challenges are gonna come down to does the community today know how to eat it? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think as we all learn and grow, ulu, kalo, sweet potato, all the starches of our ancestors are gonna be the obvious ones. And you're gonna see that as we begin to eat more of them, we begin to feel better. I mean, one of the things that we haven't all talked about is how eating good food makes you feel. And for someone that has really made a commitment, look, we eat poi three meals a day, seven days a week for the last three years, four years, and our calabash has been full. We mm -hmm. haven't washed it or emptied it. It can happen. It changes your lifestyle a little bit, but so much for the better. You know, when I, when I make poi with our family, we all get together, we, it's family time. We spend like four hours together, putting our love into our food. That four hours feeds us for three, four, five days. You know, and we each have a little calabash that's Tupperware, cause you know, getting wood is hard today. And we wrap it up and we take our little calabash to lunch and sometimes I'll go to a restaurant. And guess what, I'll pull my calabash out at the Chinese <laughs> restaurant, <laughs> order my Chinese food and eat my poi. And it's funny, but you would think, isn't that hard? I can tell people say, what is the best thing about eating poi for every meal? I can tell you without a doubt, it's being satisfied at the end of every meal. Kaleo, I have this uh, question for you, and this is anonymous, and this is just a comment to the panel, so feel free to jump in, any of you. Um, and, it, and it goes to sort of like a rumor that people have talked about for a long time, and, and this person says, I want the panel to realize that most farmers claim to grow their produce, but are actually buying produce from Costco and Sam's and just <laughs> repackaging it in the farmer's market. So do you have any proof that that's happening, or, or is it just a rumor that people are talking about? Well, I, you know, I... I don't know if it's a rumor or not. I, I've seen some of that myself, you know, but I mean, that comes back to the key, which is relationships with the people that you're buying from, mm -hmm. from the farmers. And, um, you know, I know the guys at um, Kaleo Farms, you know, I talk to them. I know the guys that are at OCG. I know a lot of different people and I talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go and buy the, you know, my produce, we're, we're having a conversation, we're friends. And there's a bit of a trust, you know, so. Yeah, I, think I mean, I've been shopping before yeah. and you go, okay, right. so where is this? And, and it, it, they seem hesitant, some mm -hmm. of them, right. with, without the big labels, they're not the Ma'o farms, you know, they're not uh, some of the larger uh, farms out there. And it, it's, it's sort of, a, you kind of have a gut feeling sometimes. Yeah, there's that, that's there, you know. Just, you know, visit the farm sometimes too and see what's going on, so. Peter, do you have any advice for someone who is questioning well, where again, their food is really coming from? The farmers markets are all run by different factions, so you need to ask the people that are actually operating the farmers markets what is their goal, what are they trying to achieve. 
So it's their, they are the one that controls the vendors. So they know whether these people are farmers. They know whether they're people that are just um, wholesaling foods from somewhere else. So again, the main thing is everything is good as far as um, eating uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. That's the main goal for even the Department of Health to change people's diet in that fashion. But if you really want to know whether it's locally grown or not, you got to talk to the people and ask them what it is. And they're pretty much very forthright about it. So, mm -hmm. And if you ask everyone down the line, the ones that are the farmers will tell you, oh, I don't think that one's the farmer. So they kind of all know who's the real farmers or not. So. Yeah, I would just second right. that and say that some of the farmers markets on Oahu exclusively require all yes. of their vendors to be local farmers. Right. So you could shop at those farmers markets and rest assured mm -hmm. that they actually really spend a lot of time with their vendors making right. sure that everything they're growing, everything they're selling is locally grown. There's that too and even when you go to a restaurant, you know, some restaurants, you know, have fish on there that might sound like it's local, but when I asked, they were like, "Oh, it's actually more south of this islands." So you know, even even in that place, you want to check in to see what's going on. Daniel, uh, this is a question for you from Ty, uh, and Ty's a student at Windward Community College's Gold Farm Program, where they educate future farmers. And Ty says, "What are the most important things the government needs to do to help farmers succeed in what is a very challenging profession?" I can tell you, policy is a big hurdle for a lot of small farmers. Um, I think that. We've been so reactionary to our needs and haven't really set forth a plan. Um, you know, I spent this last few days on Kalau Papa, and one of the kupuna, she shared a story about how important the farmers are. They're the most valuable people in our whole system. They feed the politicians, the lawyers, the doctors, the news people, the Department of Health people, the Center for Food Safety, Kanohu, even myself. Yet, after they've fed all of us, then they eat. And so in that system, they already value us more. And we need to, to fo change that focus and say, look, if you're going to farm for me, I'm going to go out of my way to make your life easier. You know, our, our program, we brought in about 70,000 pounds of taro last year and supplied it to families on Oahu. And we're shooting in 2015 for 200,000 pounds of taro for families on Oahu. And it's really connecting those links and helping the farmer, talking to the farmer. You can go to the farmer's market and ask your farmer, what's your biggest problem? Because maybe caterpillars is the biggest problem and you're looking to make butterflies. Mm -hmm. You know, in our community, we don't talk enough. There isn't a database that connects small farmers. There's the farmer's union and the farm bureau, but the reality is, is that our best farmers are farming. How can we keep them doing that? I think the educational programs, making land affordable making the red tape to get on the land, making the land competitive where if you get the lease and you're not farming it in the way that you said, guess what, you out. Because get 100 farmers that are training right now to take your place. And guess what, for those 100 farmers, we get 101 lots. So we need one more farmer to join, you know, mm -hmm. and it's really taking a different approach. Right now, from everyone that I hear, it's about liability. All the landowners refuse to let farmers live on your land. Look, if you're not living on the land, you're not farming. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of a maka'ai nana is the person that is there, that watches the food grows, so that I don't need to spray because I see this happening in my environment and intuitively I counteract it mm -hmm. before it occurs. And that's going to be a conflict that uh, will be around for a long time. Uh, Kaleo, when you look at you know, just food in general, is there anything that you refuse to eat knowing what you know now? Wow, you know, those kind of questions are, are always something to answer when it's in front of me, you know, because if I was a vegetarian and then you put me among, in, you know, Mongolia, where there's very little vegetation, I would be really, you know, mean to say I don't, you know, I don't eat meat, so. But I, I don't think there's anything I wouldn't really eat, um, particularly, I mean, in general. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly open. I, there's a lot what I prefer to eat. I prefer to eat locally grown. I prefer to eat, you know, things from that are in season. You know, I don't want to mm -hmm. eat things out of season because that usually means, you know, they're moving it around. They're using more resources to grow it. And yeah. Kasha, is there anything that you will not eat? 
Um, I think that I would say similar to Kaleo, I don't have anything that I expressly don't eat, but I do like to know as much as I can about my foods. And um, that reminded me that I wanted to show the viewers that um, since we don't have GMO labels on the foods that we have, we did produce this um, shopper's guide that you can take to the grocery store with you and it helps to provide some information about what foods are most likely to be genetically engineered so we know that about 75 percent of processed foods so that's anything in a box or a package um, will probably contain uh, genetically modified ingredients um, and you can download this from our website centerforfoodsafety.org it's also an iphone and an android app so you could bring it on your phone to the grocery store with it's you. It's interesting because you're not against GMOs, but you're not, uh, you know, you're not on the industry side either, but you're, you're just trying to educate people We're about trying to educate people. We really feel like it's a right to know issue and that people can not make educated decisions without having the information available to them. For uh, Daniel, uh, someone wants to know, what are the other types of crops that can really help create a sustainable Hawaii food system? We're Hawaii, we can grow anything you know our ability to put something in the soil and see it produce way better than it produce anywhere in the world we have seeds from the whole world what do people want to eat I mean we're talking about a local artisan market where people are producing things that other people want to eat right now you can break the market into a bunch of different sectors I mean if you need to make money in the short term you know that you're gonna plant lettuce right and if it's the midterm and you have sweet potato, you have taro, you have your long term, your ulu, your ava, you know, there's, there's things, that, there's a whole pantheon. For the farmer, it's really where are you? If you're on the Eva Plains, you're not gonna make one loi. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at where you are, and it's, everything is place based. What resources do you have? What is your soil? You know, if you don't do a soil test, then you never know really what's in your soil. And then you never really are taking full advantage of the type of plants that are best suited for that place. So. Kaleo, uh, someone wants to know, how can we encourage our younger generations to farm? And I know that it's already happening uh, at certain schools. They have planter boxes. Uh, some classes have designated farm systems. But how can you encourage more people to take that on? You know, getting people that are already in the community around the kids that are farming and get them um, just showing that it's normal. You know, this is what's normal. Um, you know, there's probably people in the canoe club or people that are out surfing that actually happen to grow food, you know, and, you know, maybe they go visit, you know, some surfers or visit someone and then after they're done with that, you know, show them some plants and things. Have you ever met a child or, or someone who is young who goes, I didn't know what that looks like? Yeah, yeah. I, um, <laughs> what actually, was the particular thing that they were talking about? Um, well, in general, actually, one of my favorite questions I asked my friend, um, his his uh, son, who was probably like around 15, you know, where where does your food come from? And his first answer was um, small styrofoam containers. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, not understanding where, where food comes from. And I remember another time I took these coconuts to our dance class and um, we started chopping open and giving it to the girls. And they start taking pictures with them, and they just didn't understand that it doesn't come from a box. So there's a lot of education mm -hmm. out there. Did you uh, expand on something yeah, that Danny sure. said, especially about you know looking at the whole picture? One of the proudest achievements I think with our Department of Health was we launched the first um, shellfish um, oysters out of the state in over 17 years. So again, that was a very collaborative project with the people that wanted to get this oyster and shellfish farming off the ground. So Kauai has a farm out there producing fresh clams. Um, they're gonna delve into oysters. We've got the first oysters out of Kualoa Ranch recently. So we've never, we haven't seen in 17 years shellfish coming out of Hawaii. I mean, what a big thing. And for me, that has such great potential to see industry out there. And my role at the health department was to always enable, to help people like Daniel, help industry out there, even though we're not looking at the economic side, but we realize the importance of helping industry that is producing food also and to produce it safely is our main goal. So we yeah, need to get you, in at the ground floor. How do you educate people to, uh, to handle food safely? Is it, is it just through the restaurant inspection process or is there something else that a restaurant owner can, can learn about how to handle food well, safely? Well again, that's um, one thing. We need to take our program and expand it also. So after we um, get the restaurant industry, we plan to also push this program out into households. The same basic rules that we have for 
the restaurant or food service industry out there, if you can practice that at home also, then you also keep yourself healthy and save yourself a lot of medical bills because a lot of our foodborne illnesses that are reported in the state are not from our licensed food um, vendors. So a lot of it are coming from households. So mm -hmm. it's very important that people know how to handle food properly and safely. So people are getting sick from their own home. Oh, yes, no question. And that is usually just something simple like hand washing. Well, and typically not knowing about cross-contamination when they handle raw chicken, raw poultry, raw beef, to not use the same cutting board and start cutting your fresh tomatoes that you're gonna use for a salad. So it's common sense things that, but again, it's education, yeah? People will not realize what they're doing, so. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I have an interesting uh, question from George K. and. He wants to know, can you grow taro in aquaponics? We just had this conversation today. <laughs> aquaponics technology is getting better and better. I will tell you as a taro connoisseur that what I've seen is that aquaponics doesn't give enough pressure to the root of the corn for the corn to mature properly. What I've tasted in corns that did grow in aquaponics, I'm afraid to say, they kind of tasted like tilapia poop. <laughs> so um, I Ew, know that, that in, the, in the mitigation of it, you can actually clean your water from the tilapia through different types of plants to get it. So you can have a system that produces good taro. What I've really been excited about in aquaponics for taro is luau leaf. So if you love to eat luau leaf, look, traditionally women, this is where they got their protein. Mm -hmm. Hawaiian complexions come from Lao Lao's ladies. <laughs> eat as much as you can, grow it in your aquaponics. Mm. All right, sounds like a beauty product we might have for <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Uh, Kaleo, what's the benefit of people eating local, more local? I mean, in, besides just uh, sort of the, the community benefit, is, uh, are there any other benefits? Yeah, keeping... Um, well, yes, the, the nutrients and the vitamins that you get from fresh food, um, food that's imported takes a lot longer to get here. A lot of times they're spraying it with, see, well, with organic food that is grown outside of Hawaii. It might be grown organically, but when it's shipped here, it's often sprayed um, with chemicals and pesticides for the trip. So it can, you know, stay safe from bugs, but then you're going to eat that. So that's a, a questionable thing. So if you're, if you're eating locally grown food, then you're, you're gonna know what's on it and what's in it. So a lot more nutrients and vitamins. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Kasha, even some foods that are, that are sold in the health food store, they have certain chemicals or ingredients put on them. For example, uh, apples, some of them have wax. Do you think mm. that's safe to eat? Hmm, you know, that's a question I don't really know the answer Does to. Does anyone on this panel know? We had a discussion yeah. about that. Peter, you know, do you know? Any, the basic rule of thumb for anything that came out of the ground that you're growing f coming from a tree is to make sure to wash it prior to eating. That will take care of 99% of your problems right there. Just simply wash all your produce, vegetables, fruits prior to eating, and then, you know, that's the best way to keep yourself safe. But you know, yes, it whole, is It is approved. There's a whole array apples, of, uh, yeah. you know, special washing soaps right. and these kinds of things. Is no, that just a marketing those gimmick? Are, or? Those are very, very unnecessary. And what we're seeing now with all these resistant bacteria, the medical community feels that it is grounded in an overuse of antibac antibacterial soaps. You don't need that kind of stuff. You know, basic soap, washing your hands with the pressure from the washing removes 99% of your um, germs from your hands. So the... FDA, CDC has never recommended using antimicrobial soaps in food service or in any other type of facilities. Even though sprays use, for the fruits and everything, is just use simple soap correct. for your yes. for your fruits and vegetables. Yes, I mean, no, well, you can just wash it in just water. That's the water. main thing, yeah. and to add to physically scrub the fruit to make sure that you wash everything off. Yeah. What What do you have to say about that, Kasha, in terms of actual food safety? I mean, some simple tips to help people make sure that what they're eating is safe. Sure. You know, your question, I don't know the answer about wax, but it did mm -hmm. remind me that um, I read something recently from the EPA that says that your average peach can contain up to 57 different toxic chemicals, 14 of which are known carcinogens. So it's one thing to keep in mind when you're really weighing the um, issue of organic versus conventional to know that some of those chemicals might be present on on and in your food so mm -hmm. if it's genetically modified it might be physically in the genes of your food if it's been sprayed with with chemicals it might be on your food so it's definitely something to consider when you're making decisions at the grocery store or at the farmers market right because the local food could have it's it's not organic uh -huh. so do yep. you I mean how do you make that choice when you're at the grocery store yeah I think that especially you know these days with limited incomes you have to make those decisions on a personal basis um, as 
as you can and the more that you know about who's growing it and how they're growing it, the better educated you can be. Mm -hmm. Kaleo, uh, someone from upcountry on the Big Island wants to know what are the programs or resources out there to help and give advice about growing their own food? Well, uh, at Kanu, we have our, our Facebook page, and you can always check there for different recipes and different how to's that are on there. Um, this is local gardens, community gardens everywhere. And you can go out there and see what's going on and check into those things. And, the caller yeah. says she lost her, all of her lettuce to deer. So oh, okay. I'm not sure you have any uh, advice uh, on okay, that. So that one, get a fence. You yes. know? <laughs> yeah, the ungulants in, in those areas is, is a big thing. You know, on the Na'i too, um, that's, that's been a big, a big challenge. Not, not just in growing food locally, but just for the you know, remediation of, of the soil. And, and so you're just going to have to find some hunters. Daniel, <laughs> obviously uh, you're not spraying your taro, but how do you keep bugs and things out there to, to keep the farms alive? You know, it's a lot of observation. It's about creating the right conditions. It's about looking at the resources that I have and not bringing new pathogens. Um, what I've seen with my previous use of chemicals is that they do one thing good, but they invite other things. And so by making a, a more pack to stay away to weed, just pull weeds, weed eat. You know, by doing these things, the health of my environment has grown, which has really mitigated the need for pesticides, for herbicides. And so, you know what, sometimes it happens. I lose some crops. It does happen. I got Phytophthora over this past winter. It devastated. What's that? Uh, it's a leaf blight. Okay. And, you know, I need to plant my plants a little bit further apart so that the leaves aren't touching during the very still kind of humid mornings. You know, there's just... Maybe I, I'm not going to get the yield that I may want out of it. But one of the things about farming, farming is like fishing. It's not catching, right? Farming is you have to put effort into it. You're cultivating something. You're creating something. And so in all the years of farming, you get better at it. Well, Daniel, I wanted to thank you for being on our panel. Kaleo, Kasha, and Peter, thank you so much tonight. And I think our viewers might be a little hungry after this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, the master plan for Kaka'ako calls for building more high-rises and workplace housing for residents who want to live in Honolulu's urban core. While many residents are excited about plans for replacing Kaka'ako's industrial structures with new homes, shops, and restaurants, others are worried about how a large influx of new residents will tax the existing infrastructure. Is Kaka'ako moving in the right direction? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahia Lenny Richardson. Ahui ho.